Where is that uh, cyber but, truck? Is that around here? That's somewhere around here. Bring on the cyber truck. Cue music. You know, I saw it on TV, I saw it at the intro, but nothing strikes you until you see it in person. Back in November of 2019, Elon made headlines once again when he revealed this science fiction inspired machine. Pickup truck buyers tend to be pretty conservative in what they like. It needs to look like a pickup truck, you know, all that kind of thing. And this doesn't look anything like a pickup truck, yeah. but it immediately makes pickup trucks look old fashioned. Well, I think there's a preconceived notion of what a pickup truck should be. And I think that's something that we said if we're going to go bold, we need to do something that breaks that norm. Yeah, so back here we have the vault. Okay. Touch of a button. Just opens right up like yeah, magic. Yeah, that's very cool. And a good so sized bed, yeah. yeah. If you want to mount like a missile launcher or something, you can do that. <laughs> yeah. And close them. And how strong is that? This, the, you can walk on it's this very thing. Weak. You can walk on it? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's very strong. It's like, so if you've got uh, some valuable cargo in the back, uh, this, this will protect your cargo and secure it against uh, being, being stolen. So it's uh, pretty stout. People of Tesla! <laughs> <laughs> With all the innovations we've seen in the last few decades, Elon Musk and his companies have brought some of the most innovative methods in space exploration and on road transportation. But it might not be just space and Earth the billionaire genius may be gazing on, it's also on the empire of the sky. The world of aviation has been the least progressive in the last few decades. But that's not because human beings couldn't come up with better alternatives, but it's just because the alternatives would be unparalleled effects on either its financing or environmental sustainability. We want the exciting things that we see in sci-fi, in like sci-fi movies and books, we want that to come true one day. Three, two, one, zero, ignition. In fact, I think hardly anyone in the public knows that this is happening. Like, how do we, you know, get this message across? Hey, really cool stuff's happening, you know? Tune in. SpaceX is like no other rocket company. They're in an unglamorous building, in the middle of nowhere, in kind of a industrial zone. But when you walk into the doors and all of a sudden you see they're making these pristine, gorgeous rockets. It feels like you've walked into a factory on another planet. I went to Russia three times to, to look at buying um, a refurbished ICBM. Uh, because th that, that was the best deal. Um, and uh, I can tell you it was very weird going there in, in 2000, late 2001, 2002 going to the, the Russian rocket forces and saying, I'd like to buy two of your biggest rockets, uh, but you can keep the nuke. <laughs> Musk made three trips to Russia trying to buy an intercontinental ballistic missile called the Dnieper. Turns out the Dnieper was so expensive, his idea never flew. So Musk decided that the only way to get an affordable rocket was to build it himself and he started SpaceX. The odds of me coming into the rocket business, not knowing anything about rockets, not having ever built anything, I mean, um, I would have to be insane if I thought the odds were in my favor. How did you get the expertise to be the chief technology officer of a rocket ship company? Um, well, uh, I do have a physics background. That's helpful as a foundation. Um, and then I read a lot of books and talked to a lot of, a lot of smart people. You're self-taught? Yeah. Well, well uh, self-taught, yes, meaning um, I, didn't, I don't have an aerospace degree. So how, how did you go about acquiring the knowledge? Well, uh, I, like I said, I read a lot of books, talked to a lot of people, and, and have a great team. Uh, raw metal comes in, and then we build the engines, uh, the airframe, the electronics, and we integrate all of that together. Uh, and, and that's all done more or less under one roof. Metal comes in one end of this factory. Yeah. Spaceships come out the other. Yes. You know, there are American heroes who don't like this idea. 
Neil Armstrong, Gene Cernan have both testified against commercial space flight in the way that you're developing it, and I wonder what you think of that. Now is the time to overrule this administration's pledge to mediocrity. I was very sad to see that uh, because those guys are, yeah, you know, those guys are heroes of mine, so it's really tough. They inspired you to do this, didn't they? Yes. And to see them casting stones in your direction. It's difficult. After years of designing and testing the Falcon 9, in 2015, SpaceX set out to make history by attempting the first ever landing of a first stage orbital rocket. I've heard it described as you standing on the top of the Empire State Building and you drop a pencil off and you have to land the pencil on its eraser on a postage stamp. Okay, this is bad. Not too bad. Look at this. Look just at this. Sitting, look at it. It's just sitting there. Look at that. What? Holy smokes, man. Visual two drones out. 300 meters. We got brace for splashdown. Copy brace for splashdown. Endeavor on behalf of the SpaceX and NASA teams, welcome back to planet Earth, and thanks for flying SpaceX. I think, I think, I think like, my, like my entire adrenaline it was just dumped, you know. <laughs> it's like, like, thank God, you know. It's a, it's a humbling experience to be a part of uh, what was accomplished. And this is the result of an incredible, incredible amount of work uh, from people at SpaceX, people at NASA. This has been eight, 18 years to, to finally fly people to, to orbit and back. You know, I think this is something that the whole world can take uh, some, some uh, pleasure in and, and can really look at this as an achievement of humanity. Um, and there's, you know, th these, are, these are difficult times when, you know, there's, there's not that much good news. And, and I think this is one of those, this is one of those, those things that is universally good no matter where you are on planet Earth, this is a good thing. Elon Musk's mission to Mars might sound like a fictional story, but the billionaire's vision is quickly heading towards reality. If he and his brainchild SpaceX can take the human race from Earth dwellers to a multi-planetarium race, it will be the most ambitious and expensive project in history, costing up to $10 trillion. Assuming all goes to plan, Musk believes that the first SpaceX rocket could be heading for Mars as soon as 2022, and a permanent self-sustaining city could take shape as early as 2050. Here's how it's going down and what the future plans are for this once unimaginable quest. Everything that SpaceX has done to date has very much been paving the road to Mars. The countless satellite launches, hop tests and rocket technology developments have instilled confidence in Musk's ability to deliver his vision. 2020 will be the year of testing and funding. With three launches completed already this year and more than 36 in the pipeline, I think saying that SpaceX are perfecting their craft would be a real understatement. 24 of the 35 launches intend to carry 60 Starlink internet satellites, which will form SpaceX's super-fast broadband service. The internet venture is said to bring in around $22 billion in profits yearly by 2025. Who needs investors when you can sell the world's most sought-after commodity, Wi-Fi? 2020 will also see SpaceX sending out its first manned rocket, which could launch as early as May. 2021 will see SpaceX flagship rocket, the Starship, embarking on its very first commercial flight. The Starship will be the first ever fully reusable rocket and will be able to bring things into space, be it people, satellites or Mars rovers, and bring them back too. The Starship will also lay the foundation for Musk's plans to replace traditional airplane travel with rocket travel. He says that with the use of reusable launches and passenger rockets, you could fly anywhere in the world in around 30 minutes for the price of a regular economy plane ticket. 
2022 will be the absolute earliest year that SpaceX reaches Mars. Every two years, Earth and Mars align at their closest point, so it's naturally the best time for a launch. Musk has suggested that in 2022, he would like to send at least two unmanned ships to the Red Planet, carrying up to 100 tons of power, mining and life support infrastructure for future flights. The likelihood of these flights going ahead are slim, but with Musk, you really do never know. 2023 is when SpaceX has sketched in its most solid date in their diary. This is when they plan on sending Japanese billionaire Yusaku Miyazawa, along with six to eight other accompanying artists on a trip around the moon and back. This will be SpaceX's first commercial passenger flight, and its success would fare well with cautious onlookers who question the place of rocket technology in passenger travel. If the 2022 plans for Mars do not go ahead, which is probable, 2024 will be the next time the two planets align, so will be the ideal moment for a second attempt at sending the first Mars-bound shuttles of cargo. If SpaceX manages to send the two ships successfully to Mars, Musk says that the next steps will all point towards a fully manned mission. The interplanetary pioneers would be tasked with setting up a propellant production plant where they would make rocket fuel by combining Martian ice water and carbon dioxide to create methane and liquid oxygen, aka rocket propellant. Being able to create this fuel on Mars would be vital as it would be their only guaranteed ticket home. Musk has said that the first visit will be by no means a leisurely one, and any future ventures to Mars rely on its success. 2025 is the earliest year that Musk believes his Mars colony could really start to take shape. The lead Mars development engineer for SpaceX explained that subsequent launches following the very first would build on what's already there. With every new Mars landing, growth and expansion would be the underlying goal. He says that the idea would be rapid expansion. Start with a village, then a town, growing into a city, and then hopefully one day, multiple cities. The city centres would house habitats, greenhouses and life support infrastructure to serve surrounding suburbs. With 2026 being the third alignment, this year will most likely see more ships being sent to Mars than ever before. What's gone up in the years prior will test the waters, and if it seems legitimately viable, which Musk believes it will be, 2026 will see the Mars city really establish itself. If 2026 sees real infrastructure and permanent habitable places popping up on Mars, having a fully-fledged city by 2050 doesn't seem like such an out-there proposition. By the end of this decade, Musk believes strongly that he will have some sort of settlement on the Red Planet, and that in his lifetime, there's a 70% chance he'll make a personal visit himself. Whether or not SpaceX will be able to stick to this master plan is one thing, but what about the big elephant standing in the room? The financials. Musk has left the door wide open when answering this question, stating that putting a city on Mars within the next three decades could cost anywhere between $100 billion and $10 trillion. The finance calculations are based around the thinking that a city on Mars would require the transport of 1 million tons of cargo, minimum. A low estimate of $100,000 per ton is how we get to the $100 billion number. But this doesn't take into account the cost of everything that goes on behind the scenes. Rocket scientists and astronauts are not known for being very cheap, and SpaceX is going to need quite a few of them. Development of materials, endless amounts of testing, licensing, insurances, all of these things cost money, and money that will indefinitely play a significant part on the suggested bottom line. It's not set in stone that Musk is going to be able to afford the venture, but the potential of $22 billion a year from the internet company sure is going to help, if $100 billion covers the cost, that is. If the cost of building the Mars city raises even close to the upper estimates, we will be venturing into a whole new ball game. $10 trillion is an almost unimaginable amount of money and would make the venture the most expensive construction project in human history. Being so ludicrously costly begs the question of why does Musk actually want to do this? I'm sure one of the first things that you learn in entrepreneur school is to not throw loads of money at something that's not likely to turn a profit. But maybe there's more to his plans than just money. In a 2018 presser, he said that there's so many things that make people sad or depressed about the future, but I think becoming a space-faring civilization is one of those things that makes you excited about the future. That is the intent of Starship to make people excited about the future.
The fact that getting the human race to Mars could be the most expensive project in history doesn't seem to bother Musk in the slightest. Maybe he has some hidden tricks up his sleeve that will land him a pretty return. Or perhaps he simply believes that you can't put a price tag on leading human exploration. One thing that's for certain is that Elon Musk and the work of SpaceX is making the here and now an incredibly exciting time to be alive. We will all be watching with eager eyes over the next few years as the true potential for Earth 2.0 starts to come to light. The proposed cost of a ticket to Mars is set to be around $250,000, with the idea being that you can sell your home and buy yourself a new life on Mars. If Musk is successful with his timeline, will you be buying a ticket in 2050? Fly me to the moon, let me play among the stars. Let me see what spring is like on a Jupiter and Mars. Fly me to the moon, let me play among the stars. Let me see what spring is like on a Jupiter and Mars.